good evening, everybody. Uh, sorry for running slightly late. Uh, um, just having a couple of issues with getting my screen to come up profusely. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is James Davis. Uh, I am the founder of upad.co.uk, and it was off the back of being a landlord for the last 16 years or so uh, that I wanted to um, start a new business in the rental market uh, that allowed landlords to uh, advertise their properties more effectively and help landlords along the way. Um, UPAD's been going for about five years now or so, and we've now become uh, the largest online lettings agency in the UK. So we've let just over 10,000 uh, properties, uh, and we offer a range of services akin to what you get on the high street agent, but on a sort of a, a la carte menu. You choose the options that you want for yourself. And anybody you speak to in the office uh, who are here 8 to late, Monday to Friday, and 9 to 4 on the weekends are here um, to assist you, and all are qualified. And I'm really proud of our um, independent trust pilot review where we get 9.4 out of 10. Um, as a quick introduction on how, how uh, webinars work, um, you can uh, hear me speaking and you can see my slides uh, from my computer on your desk, uh, but we can't hear you. Uh, what you can do and what we'd really like is to uh, send any questions or comments you've got to us uh, in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, one of the bottom boxes there allows you to send messages to us and I will try and answer as many as I can um, uh, during the uh, Q&A section at the end. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for all of you that have submitted questions um, uh, prior to the start of this webinar and we will try and answer as many of those as we possibly can. Um, we want to just a quick poll, if I may, first of all, uh, and the reason being is, is when we do physical events, um, it's obviously a lot easier to sort of know who you're talking to, who's in the room, etc. Um, it makes it a bit harder when um, you're not doing it sort of face to face. So if you could kindly select one of those options that uh, most applies to you, that would be much appreciated indeed. Um, once everyone's had a chance to select their option and uh, uh, press the submit button. Uh, I'll just bring up the results from them. Uh, give me one second. So we've got a, a broad mix, but overall most people are, are fairly experienced and have been doing this for some time. So thank you very much uh, indeed for participating. Um, we'll go back to um, the slide deck um, now um, and uh, start with the uh, questions um, that have been coming through um, when over, over the last few days or so. So one of the first um, questions that we had uh, that came through uh, was somebody who, um, I'll just bring this up, um, has got seven uh, rental properties um, and uh, wanting to know whether uh, they should be using an accountant to do their tax return um, or whether um, they should still be doing it themselves. Um, uh, let me just move this over. For some reason, my PowerPoint isn't wanting to uh, do what I want it to do. So this person who sent it in has got seven rental properties and wanting to know whether they should be um, still doing it themselves um, or, or using a specialist tax accountant. And I think there's a few things to sort of consider here, and a lot of it goes down to how much time you've got and how competent you are at filling in your land and property section of your self-assessment tax return. Um, as well as that, it, it also depends on how au fait you are with the new um, legislation that has, has come into force of recent. Um, so you've got changes uh, to wear and tear allowance. Um, so we are no longer from uh, the end of this tax year um, able to claim the 10% wear and tear. We can only claim uh, for those things that uh, qualify. Um, there have been some amendments to that, so certain things like replacements to bathroom fixtures and also to the kitchen are now allowable uh, where previously they weren't, so, so there's some positives there. But if you're unsure about um, doing that because you haven't, um, haven't done it yourself previously or not sure what qualifies, maybe you should be looking at an accountant. The other thing is you've got mortgage interest relief um, that has uh, come into force as well. Uh, this actually starts uh, in two years' time, in April 2017, uh, and this is where uh, we will be taxed um, on the interest that is charged on our mortgages. So if you are charged £10,000 per annum um, on your um, interest payments for your mortgage, um, there is a new scheme that is starting in two years' time where you will be taxed on that and it's been done on a, on a taper basis, so it's, it's being introduced over a four-year period, 
and will be fully implemented in six years time from now. But again, if you're unsure about that, and also if you're thinking about putting your property into a different structure, uh, maybe it's currently in your own name or you and your wife's name, for example, at the moment, it may be that you're considering putting your business into, into a limited company or a partnership, yep. Um, which, which gets around some of the tax changes, but, but it also has other implications too. Um, it may be worth, at the very least, just talking to somebody who understands what they're doing um, so that you can get a steer on whether you should be carrying on as normal or, or whether there's amendments to how you are filing your return that you should be considering. But the changes to wear and tear, mortgage interest relief, and how you structure your property um, in terms of limited company or, or in your own, own name are the key things as to whether you should look at using somebody that specializes in the space and arguably how confident you are in getting things done. So, Tony, hopefully that, um, that helps you. The second um, question that we got uh, relates to stamp duty changes that um, were announced in the autumn budget um, fairly recently. Um, and these changes come in from uh, April next year where there is an additional um, levy for properties that are being bought for buy-to-let purposes. Um, there is a question that's come through from Jane about whether this will apply if she's buying a new residential property for herself. And it could do, and there's a couple of key scenarios where it could affect you if you're buying a new residential property. The first is if you are buying a new property but not looking to move into it straight away, maybe it needs renovating, and you're going to still own and stay in your existing property while those works are carrying on. And the other key scenario where you could be liable for the additional stamp duty is if it's a second home, maybe a holiday home for example, where you would have to pay the additional stamp duty. So if either of those are um, uh, where you're going down as it were, you are going to have to pay that additional tax. I think on the first option if you're looking to stay put whilst you're renovating a property, what may be more sensible potentially, uh, looking at what the sums are, is to is to rent for three months, six months, um, whilst the works are being completed, uh, because that rent charge may be lower than what your additional tax charge may be. But just something to consider there. Uh, the next question we had through from uh, earlier in the week is a, a landlord called Andrew, uh, who said if uh, he's got a tenant in situ at the moment, who's asked his friend or partner to move into the property as well, um, should that landlord reference that additional person first before they move in and do we need to issue a new um, tenancy agreement as well? Well, there's a couple of key things to, to bear in mind and I think before saying yes or no, I would sit down with your existing tenant, maybe with the new guy as well, and just try and understand what's going on here. You know, is it is it the case that he needs help with paying the rent? Is it just his girlfriend um, that's, that's moving in as well, for example? Um, and just understand what the situation is, why this other person is moving in. Also, just think about the fact whether it's a, a one-bedroom property, um, can it, can it um, cope with the uh, additional person moving in? Is there enough space, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But I definitely think you should be referencing that new person. Um, it's, I'm assuming that person is going to be equally responsible for the rent rather than not paying anything, but they should be referenced, um, and that should include what their income is and so on. And you should definitely issue a new tenancy agreement. It can all have the same terms, but I would add that additional person on so they are um, jointly and severally liable for any issues relating to the property. Um, and by issuing a new tenancy agreement, the that new date, which may be two months um, ahead of where the previous one was, will supersede it. It will overwrite the previous agreement. But I think it would be naive uh, not to reference them and not to put them on the tenancy agreement. Um, but first of all, do just sort of understand um, what the situation is first before you embark on it. Um, we had another question in from Gwen, um, who has got a four-bed flat that she rents out to young professionals, um, which I think is increasingly common. Um, young professionals make up a, a huge proportion of the overall rental market, so this is quite normal. Um, what appears to be the case is you've got one of these uh, four guys that um, leaves every six months or so and uh, you're reissuing a new tenancy agreement which is a bit of a pain, a bit of a hassle. Is there another way around it other than what I assume is, is classifying your property as a HMO and having a different AST for each room within the property? Um, my, my gut reaction is sort of twofold. The first is you can't really have the best of both worlds in terms of um, everybody on one, 
but not sort of put up with the hassle when somebody leaves um, unless you're having individual ones. So I think you've got to make a decision about what is more preferable from your perspective um, of either issuing four different uh, agreements um, and amending as and when one of those moves and for just that person or whether you uh, just update the, the agreement that covers the whole property. But that's one for you to, to, to think about. But what I would say is if one of these four people is leaving every six months, is it may be advantageous to look into why that is occurring. Um, um, and the reason I say that is it should actually be their responsibility to find a new tenant if one of them chooses to move out. Because ultimately, those four people have moved in, I'm assuming on a 12-month AST, and they are all jointly and severally liable for the rent during that period. Should one of them decide to leave for whatever reason, arguably it is their responsibility to find a replacement. And it falls on them to, uh, to uh, find that person. Um, and therefore, maybe it should fall on them to find them, and, and then you issue a new tenancy agreement. But something doesn't seem right with how you've got this currently structured. Um, I think it's more about trying to understand why they keep moving uh, in and out, um, but it should be on their responsibility to find a replacement um, and then to uh, get a new tenancy agreement. So hopefully that assists you there, Gwen. Hopefully that was that was helpful. Um, somebody's asking about uh, rather than just doing buy to let as it normally is, you know, buying a place, renting it out owning it for sort of 15, 20 years, which is um, very much the norm for the average landlord, uh, and doing the buy to flip option. And I, I think you've got to look at your, your sums um, of what seems uh, the most sensible from your perspective. And what I mean by that is these are two very different um, business models. Um, one is, um, in terms of buying a property and, and owning it for a period of time, is all about generally capital appreciation. Um, yes, having an income source um, during the years, uh, but it's very much more about capital appreciation. The other model in terms of flip is, is far more about short-term gains, realizing you can purchase a property, uh, do some renovation works and sell on straight away. And the advantages of that um, are that the mortgage interest relief is going to be less of a, an issue to you because you're not owning that property for a, a long period of time. Um, you are going to be affected by the new um, stamp duty changes that come in in April next year. But I think it's a question of doing your, your sums um, on what the gains are when you're, you know, is, is an example for each of those two types of scenarios. And also, what, what are your motivations? Is it about um, the fact you've got time to be involved on doing two or three flips per year and it's an income source, or is it more about holding it steady for a 15, 20 year period, um, of which case holding on to the property is far more um, relevant for you there. So I think it's worth just thinking through what are your motivations and, and take it from there. Um, uh, we've had a question from Jane as well. Um, she's asked uh, about the recent stamp duty changes that come in next year. And um, sorry, not Jane, Robert. Uh, and what are the best parts of London for buy to let opportunities? Um, and I think there's a couple of things to to look at here. I I I I don't know of a sweet spot um, that you should go to one particular area. But I think it, it also depends uh, person by person about what your motivations are. But I think the first thing to consider a bit like what I was alluding to on the previous question is what are your motivations? Are you looking for an income source where you've got you know, the highest yield you possibly can get? Is it more about um, uh, the capital growth of the property over a longer period of time? Um, if it's more about uh, an income source, um, one thing that might be worth considering is looking at ex-council properties because they cost dramatically less than a non-ex-council property but the rent that you can achieve is only marginally less than what it would be for a non-ex-council um, property. So from an income perspective, that would be where I would be looking at. The next also from an income, uh, sorry, from more from a capital appreciation perspective is maybe looking at trends within the market. And the two things that I would pick up on, uh, one is uh, you have things like Crossrail that is, that is very much coming into play and it's redefining where the hotspots are within London and the surrounding area, as well as looking at what I call the tier three areas um, in London. So near where uh, UPAD is based is uh, a place called Cricklewood and Dollis Hill. 
and um, you have urban sprawl occurring where um, the capital appreciations in, in areas like Queen's Park, West Hampton and so on, um, that capital appreciation rate is unlikely to continue. But the next layer of, of uh, uh, outside of that, uh, in this case Cricklewood, Dollis Hill, sort of the zone three stroke zone four, um, is probably where you're going to see more capital appreciation as in people are increasingly priced out of the capital. So I think for me, depending on what your motivations are, it would be to look at those two different um, types of property stroke area uh, when you're looking to buy a new property in London uh, to get the best possible returns. And Robert, I hopefully that was useful for you. Um, Louise um, sounds like she's got the ideal situation to a certain degree, that she has an ideal um, tenant who, who's been there for a long period of time. Um, but on the other hand, and something I can sympathise with because I've been there myself, is that the property next door are a nightmare, a lot of noise, and a lot of verbal abuse, and, and nothing's really happened. What can I do? Um, now, I've been here before. I had a, um, a housing association property uh, that was next door to one of mine, and I think it's very easy to say this, but maybe this is more relevant for other people listening in, is to make sure you do your due diligence uh, before you buy a property. Um, I'm a big fan of visiting the property at different times of day, um, during the week and also at the weekend, um, physically speaking to the neighbours in the local area and ask them what they think and what the neighbor, existing owners are like and what uh, the people either side are like, because a lot of that will give you a gut feel about that, what, what that property is actually all about. Um, but I appreciate that's not going to be helpful to you, Louise, because you're currently in this situation. What I would say is that if you've only owned the property for a shortish period of time, maybe a few years, um, one thing that might be worth looking at is whether there's been any previous um, occasions where noise and disturbance has been reported to the local council. Because when you purchase a property, the um, seller has to declare whether there's uh, any issues relating to the property in terms of um, uh, the locality and so on. And there could be a breach there if they themselves or other people have complained that uh, a neighbour has been unneighbourly and that has been reported to the council's noise um, pollution people, for example, but that was never informed to you. So if you've only owned it for a few years, it may be worth looking at that and seeing whether there is a claim uh, against the people you bought the property from that you can look at. But outside of that, what I would look at is, is, is who owns this property? Is it an owner-occupier or is it a rental property? Have other people complained? I would um, go around the local neighbourhood, the sort of few properties either side and opposite, and just see what other people have said and whether they've complained to the council too. I would also speak to the council noise pollution department and see whether anything has been reported as well, just to build up a case in terms of do your due diligence on what the current situation is, have other people complained. And I would first off start by having a friendly word and I would do it myself rather than asking my tenants to do it and I would do it in a way that is, look, we're all trying to live in the same area, um, I'm trying to reach an amicable solution here, point out what is um, frustrations and, and maybe how they can overcome it, whether it's music being played late, late at night, um, point out that you know it's, it's not right to abuse my tenants uh, and maybe uh, use the stance of having a, uh, having a fresh start given we've got the new year just around the corner. That said, if that doesn't get anywhere, I would encourage your neighbours and also your tenants to report all incidents when there has been abuse um, so that the council can act. And of course, and I'm well aware that councils don't have the resources to go to every single inquiry that comes through and follow up and there's limited powers of what they can do but it's one of those things where you have to make as much noise without excusing the pun as you possibly can to uh, make some action occur in the situation. What I would also do is maybe just look at the land reg and see who owns the property and whether it's tenanted or whether it's an owner occupier and if it's tenanted I would find out who owns the property and their contact details and the fact that your tenants um, have a right to quiet and peaceful enjoyment of the property is I would have a word with, 
with um, the landlord if there is one for this property um, and get them to enforce um, what is within their tenancy agreement on their tenants with the view that you would do exactly the same if it was the other way around. So hopefully that can help you. I can very much sympathize with you, Louise, because I've been there myself and it's really distressing, especially when you've got a really good tenant in, in situ and you've got something outside of your control ultimately. But um, hopefully those are some useful steps. Um, before I move on to any other questions, if anybody's got any else that they want us to answer, please do use the um, chat box on the right hand side of your screen and we will try and answer as many as we can um, before um, the end of this webinar and hopefully we can we can get through them. Um, Coral's asked uh, uh, quite a broad question um, in terms of what direction do we see the buy to let market going and demand for rental properties. So I suppose just from a macro perspective rather than looking at geography or anything like that in particular, I think there's a maybe half a dozen key things that I've picked up over the last 12 months about trends and what I see happening going forward. The first of all is that the amount of tenants demand in the UK is going to be increasing um, year after year. And there's three things that are driving that. The first is that the tenant pool, the amount of tenants in the UK is increasing as more are unable to get onto the housing ladder. Also, those that are tenants at the moment are staying a tenant for longer uh, as getting on the housing ladder is increasingly difficult. So they're coming into it and those that are in it are staying for a longer period of time. We're also seeing um, uh, the average tenancy decreasing in length. So it used to be the case where the average tenancy was about 18 months a few years ago and it's been falling down to about 15 months. So there's a higher churn rate than there ever used to be. So Ultimately, you've got more people there, uh, but moving more frequently. The big thing for me is that with the various tax changes that are coming through at the moment, and actually also the fact that yields will be decreasing as price, house prices continue to grow at a faster rate to rental prices increasing, is there are going to be some landlords that their property is unprofitable or isn't profitable enough to keep going, so they will sell up. There will also be those landlords that stay within the market that I see generally increasing the rents that they charge to compensate for the additional um, costs that we will all be facing over the coming years, in particular the mortgage interest relief. Um, you've got examples in Scotland before, uh, you know, just as a showcase, where the average rents in Edinburgh went up 9% uh, in the last 12 months, and yet the average rent in the UK uh, only increased by 3 to 4 percent. And the reason for this was because it is no longer allowed for agents to charge tenants admin fees in Scotland. But what we've now seen is those additional charges being added to the landlord's bill, which has been passed on to the tenant in higher rent. And I see the same thing happening here, where mortgage interest relief and the additional tax that landlords will have to be paying, that additional cost in the same way as when the price of oil increases, the price of petrol at the pump increases, we will have exactly the same thing um, too happening there. Now, whilst that means from a landlord's perspective, um, your costs increase, but your, your income increases too, my big concern that we should all be looking at is that I can see rent arrears increasing dramatically in the years to come. And the key reason behind this is that we're already seeing tenants' uh, rent take up something like 30% of their take-home pay at the moment. And there comes a point when it reaches sort of 40, for example, where it's actually getting a bit too high for what uh, they're spending on, on rent. And therefore, with the growth of unsecured debt, um, having uh, you know, additional costs for, for cars and the Spotify's and all these other things that people are paying for these days, that it is likely that tenants will be overextending themselves and given we are yet to see any noise of increased salaries uh, in the UK and the heavy reason why interest rates um, aren't looking to change um, at all for the next year or two at the very earliest, is that it is likely that the affordability of tenants is going to change, I think, in the future and us as landlords need to do more due diligence when we're taking on a tenant to ensure that they can afford it, what that multiplies 
as well as maybe taking out protection by using things like rent guarantee insurance to prevent us being um, uh, losing out on rental for somebody that overextends themselves. But I think our job will be to ensure that we do more due diligence when we take on a tenant than we did previously to ensure that they can afford it. So those would be my key um, thoughts as to where I see the buy-to-let market going in the future and what we as landlords should be doing to prevent issues um, arising. Changing the subject slightly, um, we've had um, uh, comments as far as, as, as smoke alarms go and um, changing batteries and so on uh, of smoke alarms and the alarm, who, who does this belong to, whether it's the landlord or the tenant's responsibility? Now, um, as far as um, uh, having an alarm in the property, because that is a service that is, is generally there that you, I'm assuming, have fitted, it very much depends on what is within your tenancy agreement, but I think it is fair and reasonable that it's the landlord that picks up the cost of the maintenance charges to do with that alarm um, rather than the tenants. Um, I think it is unfair that the tenant picks up the responsibility for that um, is, is the general course of action. But ultimately, it's what is within the tenancy agreement, and as long as it's fair and reasonable that has gone in there, that is what will be said. But I think it is fair and reasonable that the landlord picks up um, the, the cost of those maintenance queries. So, Aria, hopefully that um, that answers um, your question. Um, Andreas has asked a, another sort of broad market question in terms of where the market is heading. Um, I think we sort of covered most of that off. I think um, what I would probably add to that is we will probably see increased institutional investment into the rental market. I see that coming within um, sort of specialist areas, so uh, areas like the student market, um, singletons, which is a very growth area, people just wanting individual units, um, very much making up a large proportion of the rental market uh, and operating in that space, um, whilst, young, whilst uh, landlords as individuals will make up the vast majority of the rest of it. I think the quantity of new landlords coming in will decrease. It won't stop or go backwards, but I think the quantity of new guys uh, will, will reduce a, um, a fair bit as they see these tax changes and, and the stamp duty being a bit of a barrier to entry. So I can see maybe a professionalization of the rental market occurring over the next five years, um, partly because of the changes that have that have coming about. So. So hopefully that answers some of your questions. Um, there's a couple of others that have just come through um, that I'm just going to have a, a, a quick look at. One is just how often should you uh, look to increase your rent on average? Um, I don't have this sort of black and white thing of every 12 months we should increase the rent by 5%. I'm a believer that I would much rather have a, a, a happier tenant, a good tenant that is looking after the property than somebody where I'm, I'm trying to earn another £25 a month from them. I'd be far happier here with somebody where I'm getting maybe 90% of what I could get, but I don't have any void periods, they pay their rent on time and so on. But I do think maybe every couple of years it might be worth looking at, um, but I'm a, I'm a fan of keeping the good guy, not at any cost, but I would very much put that um, right at the forefront. What I will also just add is there's quite a few guides um, that we've got that are available to download um, uh, that are are available from the on the right hand side of your screen um, that you can download. Um, so I do recommend you you take copies of those, um, which give you some really useful insights uh, and will be really helpful um, uh, in in being a landlord if you haven't already had copies of them already. Um, the key areas that those PDFs cover off relate to the right to rent guidance that comes in in February from the Home Office. Uh, the changes to smoke alarms and CO um, detectors um, that came in in, in October. Um, we come on to section 21s actually in a second, but uh, there's a new um, new section 21 that has come about. I'll talk about that in a minute, but there's um, some information there uh, and also uh, a checklist uh, of how to rent uh, that we need to be giving to tenants as well um, that you can also download. So, so do please take copies of those uh, whilst I go through some of these other questions. Um, just talking about section 21s, um, uh, we've had this other question that's come through. We've got uh, existing tenants that are there. The last, ten, last day of the tenancy is April next year, uh, and uh, this landlord wants them to vacate then. Um, 
what you need to do if you want that tenancy to terminate is you have to issue those tenants with a section 21. Now, up until October the 1st this year, you could issue a section 21 at any time that you wanted from the start of the tenancy agreement, as long as it was no less than two months from the end of the agreement. So you could either give it to them as soon as it started or in month 10, assuming it was a 12 month AST. So I would issue that with them either now or two months prior to the end of the tenancy agreement. Make sure you get a um, confirmation that they've received it, maybe take another copy and get them to sign it. Um, so you've got confirmation should you have to go to court that you've given it to them within the right time frame. What I would briefly like just to sort of touch on is the fact that there is a new section 21. You can download the information um, from the right hand side of your screen. But this new agreement only relates to tenancies that started from the 1st of October this year. And the key changes um, relate to the following. The first is that the format of the Section 21 is different to what it used to be. So um, any tenancies from the 1st of October, you need to use the new format. Secondly, you can't issue the new format um, until at least four months into the tenancy agreement. You can't give it to them at the start um, um, like you previously could do. And you also need to make sure that you've issued them uh, with a gas certificate and an EPC at the start of the tenancy agreement and that you've got confirmation that that was received by them. So there's new um, way, procedures that are involved. And if you don't do those bits, the repercussions are is that should you need to evict them because they haven't left, is the court will probably throw it out because you haven't followed the correct guidance. It's quite complicated now. Uh, and there's a flowchart you can download that gives you more information on that. Um, and it may be worth having a look at that. I think we've got time for one more question that has come through previously. And I'll answer a couple more that have come through um, during this webinar, uh, just so we finish on time. So the last question that we'll do um, to, that, that has come through this week, and I really appreciate all the questions, they're, they're fabulous um, subject matters, um, quite wide, wide ranging, which is brilliant. Uh, but this last one is, is uh, somebody who, Roger, who's got um, tenants who've been in situ for a long period of time, um, and now they're causing a little bit of damage, what, what should I do? I think, for me, um, I, I would want to understand what this damage actually is. Um, and is it the fact that the situation has changed? Are they no longer playing by the rules as it were? Or is it just a bit of a mishap and, and it's actually okay? So I'm a big believer in having good communication with my tenants. Understand what's gone on. Have they you know, had friends around and the wall got bashed for argument's sake? So, so do try and understand what actually happened here. Is this a one-off occurrence that is unlikely to ever occur again? And what you don't want to do is come in too heavy-footed and upset the apple cart if they've been good tenants um, for several years so far. So hopefully that helps you, um, Roger, in, for that particular one. Um, these are all the handouts that you can um, download. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions that have come through, which I'll try and answer um, uh, now. A couple of other questions about increasing the rent, um, about how much can I increase it by and how often. Um, before I answer it, I would go back to what I mentioned earlier about the idea of having a good tenant. Uh, I, it is truly valuable having somebody in there that is looking after the property, um, not causing any damage um, uh, and paying the rent on time. And you don't want to upset the apple cart. Um, within your tenancy agreement, uh, you may have a break clause in there that allows you to increase the rent after six months. Um, that doesn't mean you have to do it. Um, I'm, I, I think, you know, without trying to annoy tenants, I think every two years is, is probably fair and reasonable. And in terms of how much you increase it by, what I would suggest is um, keep a steer on what's happening in the rental market in your area. A very good way of doing that is by creating an alert on Right Move or Zoopla. You can do that by doing a search for properties in your area. So if your property is in SW6, uh, if you search for rental properties in NW6 that are two bedrooms and within your price range, you can then put your email address in to be notified of new properties that come up that match that criteria. And that will give you a steer of what is happening in your locality. And what I would then do is if you've seen rents increase 
on average by say 150 pounds a month is maybe increase the rent but not as much as what the market rate is because what you don't want them to do is to start thinking about moving out of the property and you having the hassle of finding new tenants and any potential void periods. Um, try and be fair and reasonable and I go back to this bit that you're, you're better off having a, a good tenant paying 90% of the rent than somebody that's a bit sporadic or not looking after it paying 100%. So that would be my top tip um, for that particular question. Um, there's another question here about who's responsible for fleas within a rental property. Well, generally this falls on on, on the tenant, but it, it does depend on, on what clauses you've got in your agreement. And actually it also depends on how this has sort of come about. A lot of these issues uh, relating to um, cockroaches and fleas and so on can come about because of tenant behavior. Now fleas can come about uh, um, heavily because um, bed sheets haven't been changed that frequently or the beds are quite old and they attract um, insects. The same applies with cockroaches. Um, you know, if there's a lot of food being left around, especially on the floor, uh, there's a lot of moisture in the air, it attracts cockroaches. And those are the actions of tenants that's encouraged um, uh, them to, to come about. And it is the tenant's therefore responsibility. So it depends on how something's come about and what it is. But generally with things like this, it's, it's tenant behavior that has caused it and therefore it's the tenant's responsibility to get it sorted out um, would be uh, my, my steer on things. If anybody's got any other questions on that or comments, please do use the um, chat box on the right hand side um, uh, and, and do send anything through. Um, and I think time for one last question, um, which, which is uh, probably going to be relevant for everybody. I was lobbying uh, George Osborne to back off landlord bashing. <laughs> um, so uh, there are a few, um, there's a few petitions that have been going around, um, people like Property 118, Property Tribes both online, um, the NLA, the RLA, both two landlord associations have been doing a lot to lobby um, uh, the government. Um, I've been in conversation with the Treasury um, talking about the mortgage interest relief and uh, the amount of people that this will affect crudely. Their, their thoughts on mortgage interest relief is that it will, and this is HMRC saying so, that it will affect uh, one in five landlords on average. If you um, gross that up in the fact that there's two million landlords in the UK who own on average three to four properties, what that actually equates to is nearly three and a half million tenants, i.e. about 30% of the rental market. And there's a huge amount of tenants, therefore, that are going to be faced either with landlords selling up because their prof property is unprofitable or passing those costs on to them through higher rents. So I think it will backfire on tenants and the real reason for doing this is, is political uh, and I can understand it in the sense that they want, uh, you know, George Osborne wants to tighten up the rules that it's unfair for somebody to buy their eighth property when somebody else can't even buy their first property. And politically, I can understand that situation. Also, the fact that the quantity of landlords in the UK is substantially less than the quantity of tenants. So from a vote winner or, or from a political perspective, there are more people in the tenant space that are, are, are worth appeasing rather than, rather than landlords. But the practicality side of it is, is twofold. The first is as a landlord we should be thinking on a on a 15 to 20 year time frame and what is happening for the next few years, I'm not saying ignore, but um, we should be taking the bigger picture on things and obviously governments uh, get voted in and out and policies do change. But the second um, thing I would, I would focus on here is um, that Whilst there are these changes that are coming about, um, and there's nothing that we can we can really do about it. There's no, I, I think, however much lobbying does occur, it's a politically motivated one. So rather than showing what the economic factors are that tenants will be worse off from higher rent potentially, a lot of this goes back to the fact that um, the Tories under Maggie Thatcher sold a huge amount of our um, housing stock. Um, we haven't built anywhere near enough properties that we that we need in the UK. 
and we have a massive shortage which has driven up house prices and become a big barrier for first-time buyers getting onto the housing ladder. And, and actually, there is a real need for landlords because the vast majority of us, um, something like 76% of the 2 million landlords in the UK, own a few properties that we rent out. And if we did all sell up and didn't rent out properties, the question becomes, where does this growing rental market get housed? Because the government doesn't have any housing to, to put them into. Um, institutions aren't um, coming into the market um, in, a, in a big way at all yet. And therefore, I think there's a, there's a line between being politically motivated and making a point, but also not going so far to um, for landlords to, to all sell up and go and do something um, different with their investment. Uh, and it's a fine line that they need to tread on uh, which I think is worth noting, uh, and it wouldn't surprise me though that if there are more actions uh, that come forward over the coming uh, couple of years, especially from the Bank of England, um, to bring things a bit more into equilibrium. So it, it's it's here to stay. I don't think, um, it's, however much lobbying occurs, is going to change anything because it's a politically motivated decision, and we are stuck with it crudely. Um, that said, <laughs> we are out of time. I wish everybody a very, very Merry Christmas and a wonderful festive period. Um, do download those guides. We will send them around afterwards as well um, uh, uh, so you can have a copy of them. There is also a feedback um, option on the email that will be coming around shortly. Please do give us your feedback on other questions that you would like us to cover off, um, things we could do better. Um, I'm sorry my PowerPoint slides weren't working properly. I don't know what the format was. It wasn't um, wasn't happening how I wanted it to um, this evening for some reason. But um, your feedback is really, really important to us. It allows us to really understand what we can do to improve things going forward. So um, I'd be really grateful if you can take the trouble of, um, of feeding back how we can improve these going forwards and what your thoughts have been. Uh, and all I would like to say is, is thank you so much for listening, and I wish everybody a very pleasant and wonderful festival.